Nikolai, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel. Now, let me begin by asking you, would you agree that an increasing number of Arab leaders seems to feel that the Arab-Israeli conflict was a political distraction from more pressing security concerns in the region and that in light of uh, reduced American presence in the region, it would be useful to have Israel uh, on their side? Without a doubt, this is really about regional security and seeing Iran as a common enemy. So, as you say, the notion of American withdrawal means that Israel remains one of the most powerful U.S. allies that is also a military ally. And certain Gulf states, they recognize this. Let's not forget, by the way, that certain countries like the UAE, they have signed this deal to access U.S. military technology, such as fighter jets, that they did not have previous access to. So I'm curious which other states will want to sign such a deal to have access to similar military technology. But these Gulf states had very close relations with the U.S. before. Why would they need to go through Israel to get access to F-35s, for example? Well, it's not the only reason that they're doing this. Let's also remember that certain states also had relations with Israel indirectly before as well. So it's not just about F-35 jets. It's also about a shift in the regional order, seeing Iran as a common enemy and also recognizing that with the withdrawal of the U.S. and less participation of the U.S. in the Middle East, Gulf states will want to take charge. And they also, in many cases, Gulf states have survived the Arab Spring. Let's not forget that. This tells us as analysts that a lot of these states may say, OK, well, if we survive the Arab Spring, we can actually conclude that Palestine-Israel was a distraction. This is unfortunate, but this is how they may think, and therefore focus more on regional security. Now, what do you make of the Arab League's absolute silence on the normalization deals with Israel, uh, when for decades it has been regularly critical of almost ev every Israeli political move? Yes, there's been a lot of criticism uh, directed towards the Arab League over the fact that they have remained very silent. So I think that Palestinians and Arab citizens will feel that this is betrayed. This is a sense of betrayal, I'm sorry. Uh, however, again, we have a focus on regional security. So the Arab League may have lost credibility on the Palestine-Israel issue, but where they have not lost credibility is with the regimes. I know that Palestine itself has actually given up its role of Arab League chair in response to the reticence from the Arab League. However, there is a focus now on countries like Egypt using the Arab League as a, fo as a forum to focus on regional security and to, for example, stop apparent Turkish dominance of the Middle East. Now, uh, are Palestinians now effectively left to fend for themselves? Is this the end of Arab solidarity as we know it? Well, this is a very sad moment because there is the question of, are we talking about the end of Palestinian statehood? What we're seeing now with this deal is that one of the key issues which a lot of Arab states had put forward for normalization in the past was that Israel had to accept a two-state solution. Now we're seeing that although there has been some annexation of the West Bank that's been frozen, that doesn't mean that uh, Israel has to play the same game. Now we're seeing that there are certain Arab states are willing to come forward and shake hands with Israel regardless of uh, how settlements are viewed regardless of the status of occupation. So this is a problem. We are also seeing, on the other hand, certain Palestinian factions uh, that were previously separate have united at least to condemn the deal. So perhaps we're seeing a shift from regional activism through regional bodies to more Palestinian activism. Right. Now, in the context of bipartisan support for reducing uh, the U.S. footprint in the Middle East and many Democrats' skepticism towards the, the UAE because of the country's closeness to Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia because of their role in, the, in, in Yemen uh, and their human rights record, uh, do you think the UAE's peace deal with Israel will cement uh, enduring bipartisan support for closer U.S.-UAE ties? Well, I know certainly Trump is trying to sell the deal as such and trying to say this deal is unprecedented. He's combining it with a general desire for the U.S. to withdraw from the Middle East. So there will be some who say, well, this means that we should really normalize things with uh, the Gulf states and accept such a deal. I know that uh, there are certain Democrats who, of course, they have not necessarily gone along with the deal and they oppose occupation. But what's going to happen now is if someone like Biden is elected, he is going to face a closing window of opportunity to come up with a two-state solution. Why should Israel come to the negotiating table if they are being accepted by their neighbors as is, without having to accept a two-state solution? But do you think there can be a long-lasting peace in the Middle East without, uh, with Israel not having a peace deal with the Palestinians? 
No, I don't believe that that would be possible for a variety of reasons. Firstly, this kind of situation means that there may be stability, and I think this is again about regional security, but I believe that Arab citizens, not just Palestinians, but Arab citizens as a whole, will feel a sense of betrayal and that they will not stop voicing their criticism. This could in turn affect stability in certain Gulf states. I know that in the UAE, for example, there are about 100,000 Palestinians living in the UAE. Now, the UAE has not hesitated to put their foot down in the past and even deport Palestinian residents for their activism. But can the whole Gulf state do that to all Palestinians? And what would that mean for their credibility with uh, their people and with citizens as well? Now, Nikolai, for years, Egypt and Jordan uh, were important mediators in the Middle East, being the only countries that recognized Israel. Uh, both countries also used their diplomatic relations with Tel Aviv to acquire much-needed American financial and military support, which was uh, in turn used to suppress local dissent. Um, will the importance of these countries, Jordan, Egypt, uh, dwindle if more countries normalize relations with Israel? Will they there lose their position that. as mediators? There is certainly that risk. Uh, I know that uh, in the past, you know, one of the differences between the peace treaties of then versus now is that these peace treaties did not necessarily embrace Israel. They said, we will accept that Israel exists uh, in terms of saying, you know, we have to, to, to deal with them. But we did not see active normalization, including trade deals, uh, shaking hands with Netanyahu, etc., etc. What we saw in the past, of course, was with Egypt, President Sadat, who signed the treaty, paid for it with his life. In Jordan, this was not the case. King Hussein, when he signed the peace treaty with Israel, he did not pay with his life, but he got military aid, financial aid, and more importantly, he continued to advocate a two-state solution. So we did see that certain countries like Jordan, they did not sign a treaty and say, we accept Israel as is. We will sign this treaty, but we are going to continue to advocate for a two-state solution, and we're going to continue hosting mediation uh, events to ensure a two-state solution. Now what we're seeing with this deal is, of course, there is the risk that these countries become reduced in their political importance to Washington. So we can tell this to an extent from the reaction we've been getting from these two countries. Egypt has welcomed the UAE-Israel deal under CC, towing the line with Washington to ensure perhaps getting aid, staying in power, whereas Jordan has had a much colder reaction. There's a variety of reasons for this. Members of the royal family have condemned the deal. Uh, they've also had individuals, political officials in Jordan, saying that we would only accept such a deal if Israel is serious about a two-state solution. Let's not forget that Jordan has a Palestinian majority, right. and Palestine is used at times, to be frank with you, it's sad to say, but it is used at times as a distraction from socioeconomic domestic issues in Jordan. On the other hand, we also saw recently the arrest of a cartoonist in Jordan for poking fun of the UAE-Israel deal. That tells me that Jordan may use the deal as a part of their distraction or talking about Palestinian rights, but they're not going to go too far. They will now focus on having some appeasement with the UAE so they can continue to access Washington. And finally, do you see the creation of a new front against Iran, perhaps even Turkey? Uh, are are, the, are the, our Gulf states on the same line, on the same line with, as, with Israel now? Well, I think we can look at a slightly bigger context than that. We've had two incidents now that have fractured the GCC, the Qatar blockade and now also normalization with Israel. Certain states in the Gulf were against it, such as Kuwait. Oman has remained neutral. Qatar wants a two-state solution. So we are actually seeing that there is a rise of a new alliance, that there are certain states that want to form a, a quartet or a faction against Iran and who will bring Israel into the fold for that, whereas other states like Qatar, they are more neutral when it comes to Iran, and they're willing to also work with Turkey. So we may actually see that the Gulf is politically becoming more fragmented. Right. Nikolai, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.